and try and explain that to the other five people who are waiting around there. <laughs> okay. I'm live. Good morning, everyone. We're going to do uh, just uh, five verses in Acts, but they are verses that are packed with the power of God. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm, I often don't come up with the title until uh, the day, and I realize, because my thinking has been going in several different directions, and I'm asking the Lord where, where the, uh, the, the, the crux of the matter is. And uh, I finally came across the crux of this, which is, and so I gave the title, uh, sorry Joe to be so late, uh, the, the church at the temple, the church at the temple. And uh, I find it uh, very interesting <clears throat> that in this first verse, it, just, it uh, tells us where they are, which is in uh, Solomon's portico, which is part of the temple mound, part of the structure uh, in, the, uh, main, uh, in the main court. Uh, so <clears throat> let's pray first. Father, uh, please help all of us uh, to give... Uh, credit and also to, to properly appreciate what is going on here and what you are doing, the wonderful things, wonderful things that you are doing for your church and for your people. For this is your people. They are, they are the Israelites, the Jews, and this is the, the, the beginning of your church as we have seen, and it is magnificent. And so, Father, please, uh, please give me the words to do this justice. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So uh, it says, now many signs and wonders. This is uh, chapter 5 of Acts, verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. Well, we have, uh, we have seen uh, some, all these signs, and we've seen this, these are the same sort of signs that uh, the Lord Jesus was doing. Uh, and he had uh, told his disciples that they would do even greater things, uh, but they would not be doing it. Of course, it was is the, by the power of God and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit this is where the power is coming from. And uh, it's amazing how, how he's pouring out the power. But it's, it's, not, just, it's not just amazing uh, that the power, it's also amazing that the people are ready. The people have been waiting in, in some measure, and, and they're ready to hear this. And to believe, and this is this is wonderful as well. It's it's all the people, but it's also the power of the Spirit in the people. And I think that what happens in uh, the Gospels is that we get, if we're not careful, we get a, a slightly a biased view of your a regular Jerusalem person, your Israelite. We get the view because there's so much dialogue going on with the opposition and so much perniciousness and, and uh, uh, hatred uh, in the established uh, religious system that we get the impression that everybody's like that. And, and I think that uh, an accurate ana analogy would be with our own leadership. I mean, quite frankly, uh, I would be appalled to, to have somebody assume that uh, I held the same opinions and attitudes uh, that uh, our national leadership holds. And, uh, and uh, if, uh, uh, and I add to that 
uh, the whole of uh, Western civilization, the way it's, it's, it's really it's really perfectly inaccurate to call it civilization because it is precisely the opposite of it. I, I, I met a man who traveled a great deal in the, in the, in the Middle East. And uh, he said, there is, a, there is a cultural appreciation in the Middle East that is, that is really very... Uh, that is very pleasing. They don't expect to like their government. And they don't expect you to be a representative of yours. They cut you a break because they know they're run by criminals. And so that's a, 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 a good philosophical approach to this. So it seems to me that it's fair to believe that there are many serious people in Israel at this time, uh, who are interested in truth and life, interested in pleasing God, and not in it for the money or the power. And in fact, we see in the course of Jesus' ministry little uh, snippets of uh, statements, and many believed in him because of this, okay? And uh, we should then we find ourselves then confident that uh, as we see these numbers that are building in the church, 3,000 now to 5,000, uh, and, uh, and as we see in these verses, the thing is going forward even more. They're in Solomon's portico. Uh, this is a, a long, uh, a long uh, roofed uh, veranda kind of thing that uh, is long and narrow and will fit, will fit hundreds and hundreds of people. So you're under roof, but you're not, you're in the temple grounds, but you're not in any of the inner courts. So it's where everybody can be. But I think about how significant it is that they're operating from the temple. For instance, um, uh, with the exception of one, well, they're, they're all from Galilee, they're, they're northerners, okay, and so, but they haven't gone home. They've stayed in Jerusalem. They've, they've accepted that the power came to them in Jerusalem and that this is where the Lord wants to start the church. And not only does he want to start the church in Jerusalem, but he wants to start it at the temple. He wants the temple to be uh, where they, sh they are going to be witnessing to people. So another thing that uh, uh, is uh, s silent, or actually this is completely silent in uh, the uh, scriptures, is what has happened to the temple as a consequence of the tearing of the curtain. The curtain uh, that uh, hid the Holy of Holies was torn apart, torn from the top down. Uh, I've not found a, a historical statement about how they worked it. Have we, ever, have we really thought about the implications? So I'm assuming that they had an army of people sewing it back up because they wanted to be back in business as soon as they possibly could. And that's the problem. It is a business, okay? So I have no doubt that that happened. But what does this do for the temple? Does this mean that in this one single moment, but the moment actually is the death of Christ, but in this moment, the Levitical priesthood was no longer relevant? Does this mean that every animal that is sacrificed from now on, on that Temple Mount for the next 35 years, 34, 35 years, that blood of that animal avails nothing? It's over. And so he brings the new covenant into the Temple of the Old Covenant. He brings it to 
to the people. What, what did the, the temple serve? It served a very important process because God needed, God needed people to know that things needed to be absolutely perfectly right or it wasn't going to work. Nadab and Abihu, who offered the wrong fire. And if you like, Ananias and Sapphira. A reminder. But God had the ceremonies detailed to them in the wilderness. They built uh, the uh, they built the tent of meeting made the, the Ark of the Covenant. The ceremonies had to be done precisely as, as, uh, because God is trying to tell us that he will have no sin before him. There's no equivocation with him. And so these procedures must introduce this thing into our minds. And to have only one place where he, uh, where he dwells, to have only one place, the temple, ultimately, is to keep the doctrine straight and the practice straight and perfect, because it has to be perfect. We have to be absolutely perfect before God. And of course, that's not possible for us to do. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ does for us. This is what these people were waiting for in Jerusalem and in the, in the roundabouts. And they were waiting. They could see. Did they know that the, that the curtain had been torn? Yes. Were they thinking and pondering on that themselves? And when they head into the to the temple, they don't go ahead, they turn left and wind up in Solomon's portico. It might be right, not left. <laughs> you couldn't franchise this out because you couldn't control it. How could you franchise out Judaism? How could you franchise out the temple, the place where God is? It would be all over the place in no time at all. Why was it a question of timing, the time of, of the Messiah's coming? I don't know. I don't know. It will have been the, exactly the right time as far as God was concerned but I don't think that we can plumb those depths. But the temple stood there until Christ came. Indeed, when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, at the end of the 70-year period of exile, God was zealous for the building again of that temple. In fact, when it met opposition, he sent prophets and he sent his power to remove that opposition and to get that temple finished. It should be very significant to the Israelite, the Jew, the non-believing Jew today, why he has not rebuilt that temple. In fact, he's even allowed an apostate religion to build a mosque in that very spot. Why? Because now it is franchised out. It's franchised out. God forgive me for the term if it, if it, if it, see, if it shows frivolity, but it's not. But it is through the Holy Spirit that he now tabernacles in us. And what a wonder that is. What a wonder They were together 
in Solomon's portico. And here's a, a verse of contrasts. Verse 13, none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. It's actually talking about two people groups here. It's talking about those who are strongly associated with the temple itself and not associated with God, but associated with something that they had made into their own God. They dared not go over there. And yet the people who had seen how the Christians as, how were behaving, how they were caring for one another. By the way, if, you, if you're in uh, Tel Aviv and you go online and you uh, ask for uh, help ministries, helping poor people, I was amazed. I just put in uh, a search for help ministries, and they were all Christian. No Jewish organizations. Christian organizations working inside the city. And then it says, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord Multitudes of both men and women. Luke has given up counting the numbers. They're just getting too great. He's even mentioning the women because you can't count. If you want to count by men, count, you count by men. If you just want to mention everybody, it's men and women. Wonderful. So they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. How about that? Peter is the perfect person to be given this kind of glory. Why? Because Peter knows he is nothing. Peter has been educated about Peter in a brutal fashion. And he will never think anything about himself again. To, to have denied the person whom you love and have been with for three years gives you a lot of information about your own utter frailty. I know that he, or I don't know, but I am pretty sure that this gave him no source of pride at all, personal, just the joy of seeing the power of God, the privilege of having the power of God work through you. I have had the honor of being present when somebody came to know the Lord. And I've had the double honor of being the person who spoke the words. But at no point do I apply any power to myself or privilege it was all the Lord's work. I was just a servant and so grateful to be that servant and so happy. You know, these signs and wonders are one thing, but it's what it leads to, which is the really wonderful thing. Souls being saved. People being snatched from Satan's hands. Taken out of darkness into light. This is the power that is being poured out. And the people, in verse 16, the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Just a tiny little rabbit hole here. You know, there's some controversy over the Lord's healings. Do we do we apply the notion that all sickness is as a consequence of evil spirits? But Luke, the doctor who is writing this, makes a very clear distinction between demonic possession and illness. And we should take his lead and understanding. 
So they're coming in from the towns around Jerusalem. The word is going out. Isaiah, and I'm not sure where, the, where it is, he says, for those who wait for you, these pieces, people had waited. They were ready. They were coming in. And they weren't going into the inner courts. They were coming to Solomon's portico. So, there is some history, uh, not in the Bible, but there is history concerning this portico. And that is, it's on the eastern edge, looking over the Kidron Valley at the Mount of Olives. And it is believed to be the closest location, accurate location of Solomon's temple because you can't build further, okay? And there are supposed to be stones that were not removed by the Babylonians. It's as if you're as the closest spot to the original temple when, in that portico where, where it is. Now I wanted to uh, read uh, from... A couple, of, uh, a couple of places in uh, one place in uh, First Chronicles and uh, then First Kings. So let's go to First Chronicles, please. First Chronicles 28. Now David assembled, uh, this is verse 1, David assembled at Jerusalem all the officials of Israel. And I'm going to skip listing them. Um, but it's everybody, it's pretty much everybody. And then it's interesting how David, David addresses them. Then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brothers and my people. And it's very affectionate. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. And I made preparations for building. But God said to me, you may not build a house for my name, for you are a man of war and have shed blood. Yet the Lord God of Israel chose me from my father's house to be king over Israel forever. For he chose Judah as leader. And remember that... Uh, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Cho chose Judah as the leader. And in the house of Judah, my father's house, and among my father's sons, he took pleasure in me to make me king over all Israel. <coughs> and of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord, of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, it is Solomon, your son, who shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Isn't it interesting you see the father-son dynamic here? The father has done all of the planning, but has got the son to do the application. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. This is a long this is a long passage. But I'd like us to look at it and see how accurate the doctrine is. And there's some prophecy and and clearly, uh, Solomon was, was conversant with the scriptures in how he speaks. And uh, he was conversant with, especially with uh, the book of Deuteronomy, as we see. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant 
of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were with were in the tent. And the priests and the Levites brought them. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. When the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim, for the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark so that the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of the stone that Moses had put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. When the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, Lord, has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised to with his mouth to David our father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all of the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord and the God of Israel, but the Lord said to David my father, Whereas it was in your heart to build a house my name, you did well that, was is in, that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, who shall be born to you, shall build the house for my name. And now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made, for I have risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised And I have built the house for the name of the Lord and the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark in which the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. I don't know about you, but I see all of this sort of resonating with the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Lord Jesus and how it is he is on the throne and uh, he is... he has accomplished the work. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you, in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. And he's kept that promise. And of course, this is the Lord Jesus. If only your sons pay close attention to their way of walk before me as you have walked before me. Well, they didn't, of course. Now, therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. 
yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea. O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house, the place of which you have said, My name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers towards this place, and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people of Israel, when they pray towards this place and listen in heaven, your dwelling place, and where you when you hear, forgive. I find it so fascinating that how accurate Solomon's uh, a doctrine is, how well, how well he understands uh, the Lord and the Lord's character. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house, then bear here in heaven an act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head and vindicating the righteousness by rewarding him according to his righteousness. When your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you, and if they turn again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you have gave to your fathers. I am reminded every day, every day, how unworthy I am of the forgiveness of Christ. How would I know, how would I know that God is a forgiving God if we hadn't been through all of this material with the, with the Old Testament and, the, and, and God's dealing with Israel and his zeal for his temple. And it's a matter of the heart. It always has been a matter of the heart. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, and here he's following the warnings that have been provided by Moses in, in Deuteronomy for where if they disobey. If they pray towards this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon the land which you have given to your people as an inheritance. And here again, in another one of the things that the Lord has threatened to do to them, if there is a famine in the land, and if there is pestilence, or blight, or mildew, or locust, or caterpillar, if their enemy besieges them in the land at their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man, or by all your people Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart and stretching out his hands, the affliction of his own heart, knowing, knowing how unworthy, how stretches his hands towards this house, then here in heaven your dwelling place, and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you gave to your fathers. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand, and of your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays towards this house, here in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all which this foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. And now we know... I mean, he's, he includes the Gentiles. He includes us. And of course, we are recognizing his name through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If your people go out into battle against their enemy, whatever way you send them, and they pray to the Lord towards the city that you have chosen and the house that you have built in their name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, see how clear his doctrine is. How wonderful that this prayer dedicates the temple because it is perfect doctrine, perfect appreciation. And this is a king. And they all go crazy. And he does kind of as well. There is no one who does not sin and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land of the enemy far off or near. Yet if they turn their heart in their land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned and we have acted perversely and weakly, wickedly. Look at uh, Daniel's prayer in uh, Babylon, facing, facing in the direction of the temple, which, of course, is not there anymore at this point, but obeying this. If they repent with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who carried them captive and pray to you towards their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then here in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. Look at Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego. They were a long way from home, but near the Lord. And they said, if the Lord decides not to save us from the furnace, that's okay too. That's how good their doctrine was. They weren't the name it and claim it crowd. And forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that have committed against you and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them into captivity that they may have compassion on them. Here's, this is, this is the, the temple that the Lord had them build, had him build. And I know it's not the same building, but the transfer from the original promise to the new, the new covenant is taking place in the courtyard of that temple, in the people of, of, of Israel, the Jews. And it's the Jewish church which is swelling by thousands of people coming to know God through the power of the Spirit. And they are the first, they are the vanguard of the church. Soon as we proceed through Acts, we will see the ministry to the Gentiles. And again, this uh, begins essentially with uh, Peter being directed uh, But the blessedness of our, this church, his ecclesia, because he said he was coming for the lost house of Israel, the blessedness of this, and I've said this before, of it being the Jews, is profound because they knew the doctrine. And it wasn't being witnessed uh, in secret uh, in back alleys and uh, back streets. It was right there in the temple in front of the people who had been opposing the Lord the whole time. Right in their face. And in the, in the ensuing verses, we will discover or watch their response, which of course was criminal, which is all we can expect from people like that. It goes out with the endorsement because it's the Jews. It goes out with the endorsement that indeed 
If you knew Moses, you would know him. If you knew the scriptures, and if your heart was open to God, then the gospel would make perfect sense to you. It was, it's been what they've been waiting for. We see these things in these words. In a few words, things are described to us which we have never seen ourselves. And in fact, things that have never been seen before. The closest thing to what was happening in that temple there in Solomon's portico had been acted out in the dedication of the original temple. And when it says that they were all one, they were all gathered together, such a precious concept. And indeed, also in the dedication of the second temple, there were people who wept when they laid the foundation of the second temple because they were old enough, they must have been in their 80s, I guess, 80s or 90s. There were some people who had remembered Solomon's temple and they wept because it was smaller and not as grand. So next week is going to be a mic and so we'll uh, have a couple of weeks before we uh, see the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees reacting to all of this. And it shows us just how magnificent it is by seeing how beastly they are. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your mercy first to your people and then to us Gentiles. Thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ to build the, the temple which we now know to be uh, the truth about you, the truth about Christ, and for the sacrifice that he made, making all other sacrifices unnecessary for his sacrifice is once and for all and our sins are forgiven and we will be perfect in your presence because of what he has done for us it's in his name and in honor of him our messiah the lord jesus christ we pray this amen